Good evening, everyone. So I hope y'all are having a good Wednesday. Um, I know it feels absolutely wonderful outside. So if you haven't done your connected with biology assignment today, it might not be a bad day to do it because tomorrow's going to suck um, as far as weather goes. So um, just our typical reminders as always, just remember that the quiz is due at the end of the week. We've got a test coming up next week. Um, if you haven't let me know already, go ahead and let me know if you'd like to take the test in person. I'm going to print off about 200 copies. That should be more than enough for everybody that needs to show up, but I like to just try to keep a head count of it. I know that's kind of a pain, but on y'all's end and on my end a little bit too, but I'd rather at least know to make sure just in case I, I need to print off like 10 extra copies or something like that. Um, but yeah, just keep me in the loop. If you if you had issues with respondents last time, I'd highly recommend just taking it in person this time. It's a lot easier than having to deal with fighting with a program that doesn't want to work anyways. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything more procedurally before we get started? Cool. Um, I will give you guys a heads up that while well, today's not a short lecture, but it's like a normal lecture length. To, or Fridays is probably going to be a little bit on the long side. Expect it'll probably bleed over a little bit into Monday. I did build a little bit of lee root or leeway with that, with um, the way I structured the quizzes, because if you notice, I tried to like uh, none of the stuff that's going to appear on Wednesday and Friday of this week are going to show up until next week's quiz. So that'll make it even more important to make sure you take next week's quiz. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. If it'll actually work. There we go. All right. So we've been talking all these past week, week and a half or so about evolution, where it happens, why it happens, that kind of thing. Now let's actually take a, a look back and start looking at how all these different groups actually broke out and kind of came to be. So today we're going to be starting with plants because they're pretty unique. And to be honest, it's going to be something that's going to be relatively Foreign to most of y'all, especially when we talk about alternation of generations and stuff like that. But keep in mind, this lecture and next lecture are going to be pretty useful for, uh, especially for the connecting with biology stuff, because it's going to help you kind of classify your what's an angiosperm versus what's a gymnosperm, that sort of thing. And of course, if you have questions about that, don't hesitate to just reach out and ask or ask me for help. All right. So, what exactly is a plant? That seems kind of like a dumb question, right? But here, as with everything in biology, we need to kind of set it up and have like a very specific definition of what we classify things as, so that way we don't kind of lump in things that don't quite fit. So here in this case, we're specifically referring to anything that as, as a plant, if it's eukaryotic, it's primarily autotrophic, doesn't mean that it can't produce or consume some things, but it's primarily autotrophic, and they're multicellular. These cells have to have chloroplasts in which they carry out that photosynthesis that makes them an autotroph. And ultimately, there's going to be four big phyla in the kingdom of plant family. We have your bryophytes, your seedless vascular plants, which are going to be things like ferns, um, which y'all have seen a ton of them around campus for sure. Uh, things like gymnosperms, like your pine trees and conifers in general. And finally, your angiosperms or your flowering plants. Now, plants have had such a strong relationship with kind of dictating what the environment's going to look like. As we've kind of mentioned before in here, at one point in time, the Earth was not 30% oxygen like it is today. In fact, it had a lot more carbon dioxide and a lot of other materials. However, when plants kind of came about and proliferated on this planet, that's when you start seeing the shift from massive levels of CO2 and methane and a bunch of other gases to kind of being replaced with this dominance of nitrogen and oxygen primarily. Now, plants are the producers that sustain ecosystems. They provide habitats as well as food for countless organisms. So even if you're not necessarily eating the plants itself, they're providing habitat for you, they're structuring the habitat for your prey, all that kind of fun stuff. Everything is interwoven and interconnected. Now, plants probably derive from a protist called green algae. And we believe these are the closest living relatives to plants. So here you have the carophytes, which are a group of modern green algae. And biologists believe that these were the most similar to what were the ancestors of plants. Now, I keep on saying most similar and all this kind of thing. And the reason for that is 
when you're talking about something that kind of branched off and you have that like most common or most closely related to sort of situation, you got to remember that there's been 400 million years in some cases of differentiation between these two groups. And as a result, while that original group may exist in some way, shape or form, they may not exactly closely resemble what they looked like at 400 million years ago. Um, it makes, personally, I really hate the term living fossil, things like crocodiles, coelacanths, all that stuff, just because they look like something that existed 60 million years ago does not mean they fit the same niches or act the same way. So you got to keep that in mind too. Similar kind of things are happening here with plants. Now these green algae shared many molecular features with these plants. So they had DNA sequences that reveal a very close evolutionary relationship. And we talked about how you actually derived that in the previous lecture. You have things like chloroplasts, which contain the same pigments. So in other words, their chloroplasts are probably derived from similar pathways. They also have both have cell walls that contain cellulose and both use starch as their primary storage molecule. However, the big key difference here is that green algae is pretty much only going to be able to, to live in the water, whereas plants have been able to thrive and grow up and move onto land. So these water and land are very different environments, and that's select for different body types as well as different reproductive strategies. This, from this perspective, it's a lot easier to move things like sperm or eggs around in water because it's kind of this nice, easy medium that you can move things around and interchange things. Whereas once you get into the air, where it's a lot less dense, and you're not able to float particles as easily, it becomes a lot more difficult. Now, land plants evolved somewhere in the neighborhood of around 475 million years ago. And plant evolution began when a common ancestor moved out of the water through some sort of mechanism or what have you that allowed it to kind of exist in maybe more moist soil environments, that kind of thing. And that's when we start seeing adaptations like vascular tissue, which is going to help move water around the plant, right? As well as things like pollen and seeds, so that way you can continue to have a sexual uh, reproductive cycle. Because obviously, if you're in water, that's a lot easier than it is to do in the air or on land. And finally, eventually, you start to see things like flowers, which are going to help for increased survival and reproductive success in dry land. Now, like I mentioned, plants are divided up into these four groups. And kind of like as we were mentioning with cladograms and all that kind of fun stuff, all of them can be put into a clay together, and then you can base it off of the say, flowering plant, sea plant. You have these uh, clays that include just seeded plants, clays that include just vascular plants, and so forth. And again, the big things you need to keep in mind that what defines these different groups is whether or not they have vascular tissue. So things like xylem and phloem, like we've talked about as well as seeds, flowers, and fruits. So which of these following is not a property common to both land plants and green algae? This should be pretty straightforward. Um, let's talk about it. Photosynthesis, is it in both? Yeah. What about starch as a form of stored energy? Yeah. Cellulo uh, cellulose cell walls? Yep. What about the presence of a cuticle? What, what organism is going to have that? Plant. So the, the correct answer in this case is the presence of a cuticle. Let's do another quick one here. A newly discovered plant in the rainforest has vascular tissues and seeds, but no flowers. What is it? It's either a bryophyte, a seedless vascular plant, a gymnosperm, or an angiosperm. So let's pull up that document here. So it says it has seeds. Yeah, a second. Before I start misspeaking here. So it says it has vascular tissue and seeds, but no flowers. So let's actually take a look at this. Well, clearly it's a land plant, right? So we know that it exists. It's not an algae, if that makes sense. It's got vascular tissue, right? So that automatically rules out these bryophytes, things like mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. It clearly has a seed, which means it's either going to fall into angiosperm or gymnosperm. <laughs> But the key difference between these two groups is that gymnosperms don't have flowers, things like conifers, gymnosperms, and angiosperms do. So in this case, based off of just kind of a process of elimination here, we know it's not a bryophyte, we know it's not a seedless vascular plant, 
We know it's not an angular term because it's a flower, so it has to be a given term. Pretty straightforward. Now, some of the things that we've talked about um, when we've talked about like how plant systems work back in like that second unit, right? Is that a leaf is an adaptation for life on land. It's designed to help conserve water. It's a place for actively having photosynthesis and being able to kind of control and hyper focus those areas for the plant. As well as it's just useful for helping kind of like to isolate and specifically hit sunlight exactly where you need it. Plant leaves have evolved this cuticle, like I mentioned just a couple of seconds ago, to help keep from drying out and that somata to allow for those gas exchanges. Those key characteristics are what allow those leaves to basically allow a plant on land to not dry up and die. But obviously they're not the only adaptation. You get things like roots, and roots are crucial for obtaining water and minerals while physically anchoring that plant to the soil. So tomorrow when those 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts of wind come through campus, yes, some of those trees are gonna fall down, but most of them are gonna be just fine. And again, it's all based off those really strong classic root structures. And they, they, they uh, are highly dependent on what kind of plant you're talking about, of course, but for the most part, you know, especially with big trees, they're gonna have huge massive root structures that are gonna help support them and stabilize them in their environment. And then we talked about things like xylem and phloem or just kind of collectively the vascular tissue. And that's primarily an adaptation that allows these plants to live on land. Obviously roots need food produced from the leaves, as well as they need materials from the roots to, that or where the roots are absorbing stuff from the soil, they need to be able to move that up into the leaf itself. So the plant vascular tissue there is a set of bundles and tubes that are gonna help transport that water, minerals and sugar throughout the plant. So that way the plant is basically having all access to whatever it needs. Now, finally, plants have evolved these specialized structures that allow them to reproduce on land. Now, land plants are going to have to make gametes that can survive and find each other on land. And that doesn't sound difficult, but it kind of becomes pretty difficult in context when you think about it. It's not like plants are moving around, right? They're kind of stuck in one place. So you have to find ways to, whether it be through wind, through pollinators, what have you, to move your gametic material from one plant to another. That's what makes these embryos. So you have to have these specialized embryos that are then protected from drying out. And there's a wide variety of different ways to do this. Uh, particularly with angiosperm, you have flowers, which often contain both pollen and the collection port for this pollen. And pollen is designed to especially be pretty lightweight and move between plant to plant. So you can have pollinators that actually move it around or you can just have it be moved around through the wind. I mean, y'all have been outside in March, April time frame when all the pine pollen shows up. Yeah, you're breathing in plant sperm, sorry. <laughs> and again, this pollen is an adaptation to life on land. Specifically, seed plants produce pollen, which are going to contain that male gametophyte. And that pollination occurs where uh, can occur without water, which often allows things like animals to help spread pollen to new plants, as well as wind and a bunch of other things as well. In other words, they're not dependent on the water to move around their gametes. They're entirely dependent on something else. You also have things like seeds that are specialized adaptation to life on land. So you've got seeds that are carrying that dormant plant embryo package with the food supply, as well as protecting it from drying out. And these can then be dispersed long distances and remain dormant until conditions are favorable. There's some really funky, crazy specializations for seeds, especially with the fruit that surround it. For instance, um, how many of y'all know that there's fruits that once you take them off the vine, they'll never ripen at that point versus things like bananas that are going to ripen pretty much continuously. All of that is based off of the size of the seed for the most part. So if you have a large seed that requires say large mammals to pick it up and move it, you're more likely to see it be constantly ripening. So that way you can continuously attract uh, new or new dispersers because you know, something's going to come along and eat it and move that seed somewhere else. However, if you have something that's very small, very delicate, and needs to pass through, say, the digestive system of birds or you know, maybe insects, you're going to have a very small fruit that's not going to continue ripening once it hits the ground. It'll just kind of fall down, get buried into the soil, and basically be inedible. 
And honestly, the concept of fruits in general is just really fascinating because you know you have this little body of a plant that is specifically being designed to be eaten. They put starches and sugars and all this in the right spot at the right specific time so you can make sure a seed that's generated is going to end up where it needs to go. And again, if you think about it, this is all done through evolution. And it's not like this evolution has like a master plan. It's just kind of going through pure luck for 200 million years or so until this all worked out perfectly. Again, as we mentioned, flower and fruit are also adaptations for life on land with flower producing the pollen and the egg cells, as well as fruits developing after fertilization to both protect and disperse the plant offspring. Now, ultimately, all plants are going to have very similar life cycles on, on land. Plant zygotes are going to grow into adult sporophyte plants that are then going to produce spores. And those plant spores are going to grow into adult gametophyte plants and then produce gametes. Now, some plants, this is all done in a very quick process where only one of these generations is happily for like a couple days. Whereas other plants, it's literally half of their life cycles in one of these ways versus half the life cycle of the other. So we call this the alternation of generations or alternate generations. Because you have the sporophyte generation, which is diploid, and the gametophyte generation, which is haploid. Just keep in mind in general, gametophyte, haploid, and that'll help keep these two things straight. Now, both are multicellular plants that are carrying out life processes, but they're very different how they do that. And you can actually define plants based off of how long they spend in either the sporophyte or the gametophyte stages. Now, kind of like a frog and a tadpole, these gametophytes and sporophytes involve different lifestyles over time. So in simpler plants, gametophytes are usually larger and are less dependent on the sporophyte, so things like mosses. However, in more complex plants, things like angiosperms or gymnosperms, the exact opposite is true where that gametophyte is basically a very, very small sub life cycle that may occur within a couple days just to quickly get to that, gameto, that gamete to be able to be released. So which of the following are happily? The zygote, the gamete, the sporophyte, the gametophyte, and the DMV. Let's talk through these. Diploid or haploid? Diploid or haploid? Haploid, good. Diploid or haploid? Diploid, right? So that makes that one? Yeah. The B and D are correct. Again, how are you going to remember gametophyte and haploid? What's the base word in gametophyte? Gamete, yeah. Now, bryophytes are the, that very early on their version of plants, and they're the most simplest, just basic form. This is going to be things like mosses, hornworts, liverworts. They're often kind of ugly looking and they require a lot of excess um, moisture, usually in the soil or on top of a plant, something like that. They tend to live in shady and moist habitats where they're going to help build up the soil that larger plants use. It's going to be a little bit harder to find in places like Central Florida, but if you know where they are, they're pretty easy to find. Now, bryophytes are both non vascular and seedless. And Basically, this kind of implies that they're the earliest possible plants, probably because they, um, again, don't have all these specialized adaptations that we see in later plants to help those other plants thrive on land. And as a result, kind of like we've been talking about, a great example of this um, in a very similar kind of situation is you've got amphibians that are so reliant on the water still. These are very much the amphibians of the plant form, where they're, they're out of water, but they're not quite yet. They still have some issues going on. Now these tend to be very small and compact because without uh, vascular tissue, bryophytes lack that physical support structure which allows them to move all those nutrients around a lot easier. And as a result, uh, materials have to move from cell to cell within the plant via diffusion and osmosis. Additionally, bryophytes also have a very small sporophyte stage. So the sporophyte in a, something like a, uh, a moss or whatever, is going to be simply just a stalk that's attached to the gametophyte. And basically that whole sporophyte stage is pretty quick. And for the most part, a moss is haploid, which kind of makes genetically sampling these things somewhat difficult. 
These sporophytes are going to be there to produce spores that then grow into the new haploid gametophyte plant, which is how it's going to spend the majority of its life. So here, if you're say talking about a moss, you've got primarily all these gametophytes, the classic <laughs> clean looking structures that you think about with moss, and then they stop from the actual sporangium of the sporophyte. Additionally, bryophytes are going to have to require uh, water in order to reproduce. So gametes form by a mitosis and into separate sperm and egg. They're going to produce structures on the gametophyte. And then the sperm cells are going to swim to the egg cell in the film of water that coats the plants. You can actually do this pretty easily in the lab. It's kind of cool to see. Uh, if any of y'all ever end up taking uh, the actual bio tube, you do that as an experiment. All right. So what structure indicated by this arrow, what does it produce? That's a terrible arrow, but we're going to just assume that it's pointing to this. So what is that? Is that the sporophyte or the gametophyte? Gametophyte. Sporophyte, right? Which means that it produces what? Spores. What is a spore? Diploid or haploid? Spores. Diploid. Perfect. So yeah, it's going to be there to produce spores. Now, seedless vascular plants are plants that have a vascular system, but don't have the fully formed seeds that you associate with something like a pine tree or flowering plants. There's about 12,700 of them that are currently existing, and they have both xylem and phloem, but no seeds or flowers, like their name suggests. Um, these are, again, going to be things that include stuff like ferns, horse tails, with ferns, which is very similar, and with something called cold mosses. They're pretty distinct. You're not going to see a ton of them around here, except for probably ferns, usually in more, again, more wet areas. Now, this phylum is going to be primarily composed of those true ferns, as well as their close relatives, the club mosses, the horsetails, and the, uh, the wisp ferns. And you can see a, a bunch of different versions of this. So here's what an actual club moss looks like, where it kind of looks like a little mini fern. Um, spike mosses, which are rather similar. This wisp fern, which all looks kind of looks like you're in between thin grass and, and algae, as well as your classic things like horse tails and true ferns, like you see plants around all here on campus. Now, vascular tissue that developed in these things are going to allow these plants to become much bigger and much larger than bryophytes, which makes sense, right? They're not reliant on diffusion or osmosis anymore, which gives them an edge for competing out other plants for sunlight. They now have a lot more control over where sunlight hits and being able to overshadow other things in the, in the process. Now, many of these seedless vascular plants are going to have to live near water. So and it, it makes sense if you think about it, especially with a lot of ferns in particular. If you look around where they're at, they're usually in those moist soil areas, often at the edges between where a pond is starting and where the upland is starting, kind of like in that intermediary zone. And additionally, they're going to primarily find those more shady habitats where their roots and their rhizomes are going to help to stabilize soil and prevent erosion. But they're not a super well developed root system just because they don't have the structure as much compared to something else that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, seedless vascular plants also have a large sporophyte stage. So you're going to start going away from that gametophyte and actually start moving towards the sporophyte where it's about 50 50. At this point. So here in seedless vascular plants, the sporophyte is going to grow up and out of the gametophyte. And as it matures, it's then going to detach and grow separately and then produce spores. So, for instance, here in this first level here, you've got this mature sporophyte that's going to produce a sporangium, which is under, going to go under uh, mitosis with all these spores and start producing these young gametophytes. These gametophytes will be independent, it's going to grow out on their own. They're then going to quickly go back to fertilization. We get back to the sporophyte stage. So it's, it's roughly like 60% sporophyte, 40% gametophyte, but they're still relatively equally represented compared to either a bryophyte versus um, a more derived plant, like an angiosperm or a gymnosperm. Now, again, um, because they don't have like a specialized seed that's going to protect them from desiccation. In order to get these embryos and kind of safely shuttle them to becoming new plants, it still needs water. So 
These gametophytes are going to produce both male and female gametes. Their sperm are going to swim from male to female gametophytes in water, and that's what's going to allow that fertilization. So again, you still need water in this. They're still pretty heavily dependent on water. It's kind of like, again, this intermediary stage between what we classically, classically think of as plants versus kind of something more like an algae or something like that. And that finally gets us to the gymnosperms, which are what we call naked seed plants. Now, gymnosperms were first, the first plant to evolve and as well as the first uh, plant to exhibit seeds and produce pollen. Their seeds are considered naked because they're not covered in some sort of fruit, which is going to be a trait that you're only going to see in angiosperms. Now, these are a lot of the really classic species that you're going to find here. Um, everything from Eastern red cedar, Atlantic white cedar, longleaf pine. They're incredibly critical to life on Earth and life as humans. But like I've been kind of alluding to, gymnosperms vary greatly in their reproductive structure, their leaf types. You have things like psychic and conifers that are going to produce cones to reproduce. Basically, there's a shit ton of diversity for this group. Absolutely massive. So you can have things like conifers here that are more adapted for colder climates and handle being far and away from a lot of water. Do things like uh, this gecko tree that's been around since the dawn of the dinosaurs. Really cool plant. Uh, except for it smells like crap. Um, or psychid. You probably have seen a ton of those just wandering around campus and wondered what those are. Um, I do want to take a second to talk about some really cool ones that we have here on campus. As you've been, I'm sure, noticing as you're walking through the Arboretum, there's some massive pine trees out there that are probably about 100 feet tall, about yay big around. And while there's a couple of different species out there, the dominant one, particularly on the inside of the trails, so kind of the, a lot of the trails there tend to be kind of a perimeter, right? So on the inside of them, you often see this, what we call a longleaf pine savanna. Now longleaf pine is a very special species to the Southeast. Um, it's responsible for a lot of the reasons why we were such a dominant naval force for a long time here in, this, in, in the US, because it produced things like turpentine, as well as pine sap that could protect and keep plant or wood sealed from going over long distances, as well as just being a massive timber producer. So we lost most of it up until about 100 years ago or so. And there are very few places that have old growth tall, or long leaf pine. Now, what's really cool about it is it's incredibly fire tolerant. The species is literally designed to be burned every couple of years. So that way it can outcompete and handle taking over an entire environment. Really cool. In fact, they have specialized cones, and you see this with a lot of other pine species, but nothing quite to the level of longleaf pine, where the only way the cone will open up and release its seeds is if you literally burn the cone. Really cool. And we'll talk a lot more about this when we get into our Florida ecology lecture here in a couple of weeks. Now, ultimately, there are four primary groups of gymnosperms as we've kind of been alluding to, and there's about 800 existing species of them. The most well-known of these are the evergreens, things like conifers, with their needle-like leaves. But again, there's other things like cycads, gecos. You might see those on campus, but they're primarily going to be planted, and they're primarily from uh, Central and South America or Asia, where it's kind of these leftover pockets from when Pangaea kind of formed and was able to these couple areas where those plants were able to hold on past the evolution of flowering plants. Um, the big thing here that's important to keep in mind is it's primarily going to be an independent sporophyte stage, where for the most part, these plants are going to be primarily sporophyte with a very small gametic, gametophyte stage. So let's talk about that. Now, the sporophytes of most gymnosperms are the woody trees or shrubs that you associate with those types of trees, right? And their gametophytes are going to be those male and female cones that they produce. So in other words, it's kind of isolated that gametophyte into just almost like a secondary structure for the plant. It's not actually its dominant independent living stage anymore. Um, it's kind of like um, somebody that you know has been out on their own for 20 or 30 years and then they got a divorce and then moved in back with their parents. It's kind of the, the, the vibe that I get from this whole thing. Now, gymnosperm cones are going to develop into tiny gametophytes. 
And again, that's going to be where you're actually producing that pollen, which is the sperm for, for these plants, as well as the ovules, which are going to contain the eggs that are going to be formed in the female counts. Now, unlike a lot of the other things that we've been previously talking about, gymnosperms do not require water. The sperm doesn't need that water to swim through to reach the egg for fertilization. And you have this windblown pollen that's going to move grains between the scales of that female cone and adhere to the ovules. This fertilization is going to occur inside of the ovule, and that's where you're actually going to get that beginning of the next four or five stage. Now, these seeds are there to get, once you have that fertilization, you're going to actually have the formation of a true seed. And again, those seeds are there to have that tough outer coat that can then be dispersed via wind or animals. So in other words, it's not totally reliant on just kind of being protected on, or it can live on its own. And when the conditions are favorable, they're going to germinate into the seedlings, which are going to develop into mature sporophyte trees. So for instance, if we're talking about that long leaf pine example, yeah, they're fertilized and ready to go, but it's not until that cone opens up after a fire that it's then going to let those seeds drop and then start kind of generating new trees. Let's do another review question. So how is gymnosperm reproduction different from that of ferns? Let's talk through this. Gymnosperms produce seeds, ferns don't. Is that correct? Or not? Yeah. yeah, that was correct. What about gymnosperms produce swimming sperm where ferns don't? That's incorrect, right? Which one is going to actually produce a swimming sperm? Ferns. So your, your vascular um, non seeded plants. What about gymnosperms produce zygotes ferns don't? Is that correct? Yeah. No. Because both of them do, right? Everything produces a zygote, it has that gametophyte state. Sure Finally, gymnosperms don't produce spores, but ferns do. Is that true? That spore stage, in fact, is the dominant stage for those gymnosperms. It's their, their kind of classic form. Now, something you'll really want to take a whole lot of time to make sure you're paying attention to is make sure you can clearly identify which one is the dominant stage per grouping. So if you're talking about, if I say, what is the dominant stage for an angiosperm or a gymnosperm? You should know that's a sporophyte, not the gametophyte, or vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah, obviously the, the answer was clearly A. Now, finally, that gets us to our last and probably the most diverse group of organisms when it comes to plants. That's the angiosperms. And again, these are going to be the, the plants that are going to produce seeds and fruits. And as a result, they're often called flowering plants. However, keep in mind that flowers, as we perceive them often like as wildflowers and all that kind of fun stuff, are always what they look like. You can have things like the, the Raphalasia flower. It's also known as like the stinking dead corpse flower that literally gets to the size of this desk and literally smells like just rotting flesh for a week and a half of its entire existence. And you know, these flowers can exist for a couple of days or they can exist for the entire lifetime of the plant. It just kind of depends. And oftentimes, because of the evolution of these flowers, you're going to see a massive explosion of biodiversity for just about everything else, too. Because you know, if you're designed to only fertilize a specific flower design, you're not going to be able to fertilize something else, unless your food resources and all that kind of stuff are designed to purely fit that one specific plant. So angiosperms, they produce pollen, just like gymnosperms do, and they have egg cells, but again, they're kind of bound in, up in that flower, which is eventually going to develop into a fruit after fertilization. Now, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that the botanical uh, term for fruit is very different from the culinary term of fruit. I think we've talked about this before. So I think the classic, the classic phrase that I've always kind of thought of it as, you know, being intelligent is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Being wise is knowing that it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. So just kind of keep those things straight in your head and kind of keep in mind that they are different for different reasons. Now, most plants today are going to be angiosperms. In fact, 95% of all living plant species are angiosperms. They evolved about 144 million years ago, rapidly diversifying into over 260,000 different species. 
Now, mind you, this doesn't hold a candle to some things like insects, which often have very specific isolated life stages that only work on one specific type of plant in a very specific life stage, but it's still really cool. And like the gymnosperm, the angiosperm is going to be primarily sporophyte dominated. For instance, the sporophyte in this case is going to be extremely large and conspicuous, where that's where you're going to get the most of the growth and development of the plant. And the actual mature gametophyte is only going to really be found inside of the um, within the flower itself. It's not even, it's kind of like how the cones are kind of their own separate gametophyte and gymnosperms. Very similar kind of thing, except for in angiosperms, you have additional tissue that's outlined on the outside of it. That flower structure is all the still the sporophyte. Now, those angiosperm flower uh, are the sporophyte reproductive structures, and the pollen sacs within the flowers produce those gametophytes. So it's actually a very small subsection of this plant that's going to be gametophytes. Again, primarily dominated as the sporophyte stage. Now, angiosperm gametophytes actually come together during pollination. So during pollination, a grain of pollen, which is going to be a male gametophyte, is going to produce a pollen tube to reach the ovule, which is a female gametophyte, and actually facilitate fertilization that way. Now, angiosperms have what we call double fertilization. That means that two sperm nuclei are going to actually travel through that pollen tube. And once one is going to be used to fertilize the egg, forming the zygote, and that's going to be the first cell of the sporophyte. And the other sperm cell is going to fertilize the central cell's polar nuclei. And this will develop into the endosperm, which is going to be there to feed the embryo while the, that seed is maturing. Now, a big thing to keep in mind with this is that a reason why we have such massive diversity is that whole concept of gradualism, right? Where you have all these small little niches as these plants are slightly differentiating that insects are going to follow them for. So pollen is often transported by great distances by a wind, whereas plants with attractive nectar plants, or nectar petals or bright colors are going to be evolved with animals that pollinate with them. And as a result, the more they kind of rely on animals, the more likely you're going to see the crazy amount of diversity that I've been mentioning. In fact, um, there's a funny meme that was going around on um, like wild green memes for ecological themes. It's a weird Facebook group that's kind of entertaining to follow every now and then. Um, and it was talking about how like the 1800s, this crazy flower with an extremely long tip to the end to actually get down to those nectar tubes, right? Well, there had to be some sort of reason why this specialized structure existed, right? Obviously, there's something that's evolved to fit that niche and be able to get pollen and nectar from that, or otherwise it'd be kind of useless. And that plant would exist and no longer exist because it wasn't getting pollinated anymore. Well, for like a hundred years after Charles Darwin observed this flower, nobody had any idea what actually pollinated this. And then about like five to ten years ago, Somebody finally got it on video of one of these crazy looking moths with one of the weirdest, longest tongues anybody's ever seen um, actually pollinating this flower. And so as a result, uh, I think they named it after uh, Gene Simmons, the lead singer from Kiss. <laughs> kind of funny. But so, so the flower is actually named after Charles Darwin and the actual insect that pollinates named after Gene Simmons, which I just find the weirdest, weirdest kind of connection in the world. So I find it funny to point out. So another one of these quick review questions, I apologize. I know they kind of get a little repetitive, but I use them as kind of an excuse to help you think a little bit more about these things. So for this one, we're talking about in the angiosperm life cycle, the seed is analogous to what in the human life cycle? Either the male reproductive organs, the female reproductive organs, the uterus and the fetus, the sperm cell or the egg cell. Which of these makes the most sense? Same, right? Because like, the uterus and the fetus in a mammal, right? That angiosperm, that seed is both analogous to both because as a result, you've got this kind of protective casing with an endosperm in there that'll provide the sustenance for that seed as it develops, as well as you have the actual eventual sporophyte that's gonna come from it. So yeah, the answer is C. So again, as you're kind of reading through this stuff, the big thing to really focus on is this alternation of tissue. Which one's a diploid? Which one's a haploid? Which one has a dominant sporophyte state versus which one has this the dominant hematophyte state? 
Now, as you're doing your connecting it to uh, with biology two assignment, the 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 level of identification that I'm asking for when I ask you to identify plants is to one of these four groups: angiosperm, gymnosperm, bryophyte, or the vascular non seeded plants. If you would like to go further than that, that's totally fine. But just stick to that level and you'll be just fine. Basically, we're using it as an excuse to brush up and actually have to go out and look for these things in the real world to see what they look like. Yes. The gymnosperms, the angiosperms, and the seedless non-vascular vascular plants. So in other words, that first, let me pull it up here real quick. So when you're looking at this chart here, and see how it kind of breaks things down, you've got bryophytes, seedless vascular plants, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. Those are the four big groups that I'm looking for to, for you to find examples of, whether it be for the extra credit or for the actual connecting with the sign up. Sorry, I'm, I'm sure some of y'all just got like major uh, motion sickness from that. Now, uh, one of the things that's kind of cool is you can actually look at the where seeds are occurring as well as where they've been deposited over time to not only look at what the plant community was like 400,000 years ago, but what things were being eaten, what they weren't, and how, like the general composition of things. So for instance, somebody was able to identify chloroplast DNA isolated from sediment samples. So they didn't even have to find the seeds themselves. And from that, they were able to show that herbs were, were predominantly the kind of main um, plant group that were dominant on these Siberian steppes about 400,000 years ago, until about 10,000 years ago when mosses and shrubs overtook them. More than likely what happened is, and you see this very similar kind of relationship in uh, places like uh, the upper portion of the Midwest, like right in kind of like take Montana, um, upper portions of Wisconsin, upper portions of Michigan. Basically what happened is about 10,000 years ago, you had major glaciation events that came through to scrape everything down from the soil. And as those glaciers receded again, that's when you're gonna start seeing the, the plants that survived or the plants that were nearby recolonize those areas. And what's really cool is that we actually had a speaker come to when I was at my, uh, where I, took, I did my master's. We had an entire lab that all they did is go out into bogs and take these sediment core samples that would be from the length of here they got here, and they were able to, based off of kind of the deposition time and all that sort of stuff, identify seeds down to the species and pick out how the entire plant community had changed, and as a result, how that influenced the animal community. Really cool. So, with all that being said, plants are cool, even if they are a little bit boring. Um, they have amazing diversity and a lot of really cool stuff going on. Tomorrow, or sorry, month or Friday is where we get to the fun stuff. Then. We're going to go through all the different groups of animals. I'm going to hopefully have some specimens that I'm going to be bringing in, including everything from a king cobra, as well as um, some other cool things that I can bring in as well from the biological collections here. It's dead, don't worry. That's Although the live one we can bring in at another time, let's see. All right. So as always, don't forget, all of your typical reminders. If you have questions, come talk to me.